uh, we were saying that uh, the if the that the in our case what we have here in effect in this diagram is that this is Paul and Paul is suing Danco and Paul Danco is saying to Paul you should have sued Tom also well Danco can implead Tom and Danco is saying Paul you should have sued Tom because we're going to get burned if you don't sue Tom and just isn't true it's not true Paul did not need to sue Tom because Danco can do it himself let's talk about what rule 19 a and b say so that we can see how the rule specifically uh, says this uh, let me uh, let me uh, put out some more details of these rules so you can see how they work first of all it's very useful for you to look at what 19 a and b actually say because 19 a and 19 b are if you took it if you look in your what the right books on uh, civil procedure and look at these rules you'll see that 19 a is really a very lengthy rule and so a well, one sentence summary of what it says is never going to get it all so you need to look at the rule itself to see what it really says what rule 19a says is that there are some situations where you must where the uh, where you must join uh, uh, some other party some third party and the rule 19 that tells you how to decide whether or not you must join some other party that rule is broken into two parts. Rule 19A says, 19A right here, says here are some circumstances where you ought to join the third party. So the first set of rules are those where you ought to join. And the circumstances under which you ought to join, we need to talk about those. And 19b uh, then has, if someone ought to be joined, if a 19a person is, is identified as a person who ought to be joined in this lawsuit, and suppose they ought to be joined, then if you can join them, just go do it. But if you cannot join them, what do you do then? And the way the rule is written is that if you cannot join somebody who's identified in 19A as a person who ought to be joined, then you need to look and see if this person who ought to be joined is a person who really must be joined. In other words, they are indispensable. But you don't look to see if the person is indispensable until you first decide whether or not they are a person who ought to be joined. How do you decide who ought to be joined and how do you decide if they, are, if they ought to be joined and you can't? Do you have to dismiss or can you go ahead? Please read 19A because this is a very shallow discussion if you don't actually read the rules so you can see what we're talking about here. What 19A says, in fact, I encourage you to stop the, the video right now and get out rule 19a and read it so that what I'm saying to you supplements your reading rather than trying to use it to replace the reading. Rule 19a says who are the people that ought to be joined? It identifies, I'll put here ID, it identifies the people who ought to be joined and they are the people who ought to be joined fall into two classes of people. One are the people who are going to mess up somebody who's already in the lawsuit if you don't get them there and the other is people who are going to mess up themselves if they don't get into the lawsuit once again you've got a third party and the question is this third party a person who ought to be joined and 19a says 
The third party is a person who ought to be joined if you're going to mess up the people in the lawsuit. The people in the suit. Or are you going to mess up yourself? The person left out of the suit. How do you mess up the people who are in the suit? Well, the way you can mess up the people who are in the suit is these people might be subject to inconsistent recoveries, and that's our problem, or they might be subject to double recoveries, or they might not be able to get adequate relief without this third person. Three ways that you can mess up the people who are in the suit. Three ways, I'll put them right here. The three ways you can mess up people who are in the suit. One is the people who are in the suit might not get adequate, might not be able to get adequate relief if you don't bring the other person in. For example, you sue uh, one joint tenant for adverse possession of some property, and there were two joint tenants, well, you're probably going to need them both. I don't think you can get adequate relief without both of those people. So uh, one case is where you cannot get adequate relief without bringing the third party in. Second way you can mess up the people in the suit is that somebody who's already in the suit can be subject to inconsistent, inconsistent results. That's our case here with Paul, because Paul sues Danco. Danco says, if I lose and I have to pay off Paul and I then bring a separate suit to try to get my money back from Tom, I might lose that one also inconsistent results. And so the, uh, so first, inadequate recovery without the person. Person may be subject to inconsistent results. And finally, the person may be subject to double recovery. A person who's in the suit may have to pay twice if you don't bring the third party in. So those are the three situations. In, uh, inadequate recovery, inconsistent recoveries, double recoveries. So that's how you can mess up the people who are in the suit. How can you mess up the people who are out of the suit? If you do something that makes it, this person who is left out of the suit, it makes it harder for them to get their rights later on in some other lawsuit. Makes it more difficult for them to recover their rights at some later time. Suppose you uh, you identify somebody who ought to be in the lawsuit because Paul will say, pardon me, Danco says, Tom ought to be in this lawsuit because we, Danco, may be subject to inconsistent, inconsistent recoveries if you don't get Tom into this lawsuit because uh, if you don't get Tom into this lawsuit because Again, Paul sues Tom, sues Danco, Danco pays, Danco tries to get his money back and loses. And so they're saying, in order to prevent us, Danco, from being exposed to these inconsistent recoveries, then Tom, you, Paul, should sue Tom. And so it's true, Danco has identified a person, Tom, who probably ought to be in this lawsuit. But can you proceed without Tom? That's what 19b is about. And the answer is that to decide whether or not you can proceed without this third person, can you proceed without them? If they are determined by these four factors to be uh, indispensable, if they are determined to be indispensable, then you got to get them in there or you're going to get dismissed. And so how do you decide if they are indispensable? And you use these four factors. But the basic idea under 14, 19b is that what the court is going to see is now that we've identified a person who ought to be joined, can we proceed in good conscience? without the 19a person? Again, I realize this writing is small, so I will say it several times. 
the question here under 19b, if you read it, you'll see that the basic question the court will ask is, can the court proceed in good conscience without the 19a person? And the answer in our case is going to be yes. The court can proceed in good conscience without making Paul sue Tom, without making this happen, Paul sue Tom, because if Danco is really concerned about inconsistent recoveries, Danco has the option of impleting Tom right now. And that will avoid, that will get Tom into the lawsuit and the courts take ancillary or supplemental jurisdiction, so there's no question that Tom can get him in here unless you can't get personal jurisdiction over Tom for some reason. And you, and the, uh, you can get personal jurisdiction because they know where Tom lives, they can find him. <coughs> so, um, the, uh, so Tom, Tom is not an indispensable party. Please look at these four factors here. I'll tell you what they are quickly, but please read them so you can think about them some. First factor is, to what extent can the court carve out some, well, let's back up number one, is if somebody is going to get injured, if you leave out this 19A person, if someone's going to, can, let's back up all the way back. Can the court proceed in good conscience without the 19A person? Factor one. How badly is the, whoever's going to get injured, how bad is the injury? Number two, how can the court carve out some kind of a remedy so that the person who's going to get injured doesn't get hurt so bad? Number three, if you, um, can the plaintiff in the lawsuit get an adequate remedy without this person? Because if the plaintiff cannot get an adequate remedy without this person, there's no point in going on with the suit. And number four, if the court dismisses this claim, does the plaintiff have somewhere else to go? So if you read those, those are the four factors. But you can see, without even getting into the details of those factors, the court can proceed in good conscience without Tom, because if Dan is that worried about an inconsistent outcome, Dan can implead Tom. And that is the answer to uh, this question. That's the answer to all the parts of this question. The first part of the question was, uh, well, let's look at the four calls, look at the calls. The first call of the question is, did the uh, district court rule correctly on Danco's motion to dismiss Paul's complaint? Well, uh, the, should the court have dismissed Paul's complaint? No, Paul, uh, uh, they should not dismiss Paul's complaint uh, for lack of subject matter or I'm sorry, yes, they should have dismissed for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Okay, subject matter jurisdiction because they only got $70,000 here. Also, uh, personal jurisdiction, you can get personal jurisdiction over Danco because we went through the steps for that. And then finally, uh, is Tom indispensable? The answer is no, Tom is not indispensable because what Danco is worried about, Danco can take care of that by impleting Tom. Okay, that's how you would analyze that question. Let's look at another one and do the same thing. Our second question for today is the uh, question from uh, July 99. In the July 1999 question, we're going to proceed a bit faster because we can now. In the July 99 question, it reads as follows. Uh, Pat, a, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, what I'm going to do here is to erase this material so we can put the drawing for our next question on the board. Oh boy, we really need that stuff for cleaning this board. I'll do it. 
Uh, yeah. Bring a, bring the whole roll. Actually, I think Pat was uh, living in State X when he was arrested and charged with violating State X criminal law. So Pat's living in State X, so let's draw it here. Here is State X. And this is where Pat lives. Because of overcrowding in the State X penitentiary, however, Paul was forced to await trial while incarcerated in the security wing of Delta Hospital, a private hospital for persons with psychiatric disorders located and incorporated in neighboring State Y. So here is State Y. And the hospital is here. And they tell us that it is incorporated here. And this seems to be also its principal place of business. Both the reason I believe it is their principal place of business is because line nine says that it is located and incorporated in neighboring state Y. And so it looks like hospital is a resident of state Y, and Pat is a resident of state X. Second paragraph, and so we have diversity of citizenship. Pat filed a class action complaint against D in federal district court in state X. So the suit's here. So the suit here is Pat versus hospital in federal court. And he files his class action on the behalf of himself plus 25 uh, similarly situated inmates. So the suit is for itself. So the plaintiff equal to itself plus 25 uh, inmates. The complaint alleged violations of the state why, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the The complaint alleged violations of the Statewide Prisoners Act. So here's Statewide. So they, uh, this is violation of state wise um, prisoners' rights. Which guarantees, among other things, the right to safe food. The complaint alleged, line 15, the complaint alleged that the food served at D, at the hospital here, uh, was often spoiled and contaminated with vermin droppings from mice, and that as a result he suffered continual GI disorders. Jesus. Uh, so Paul saying, you people did some bad things to me. That's this suit right here. Paul requested 70,000 in damages. So the amount equals 70,000 in damages. Uh, plus um, an injunction. Plus injunction. Prohibiting D from uh, continuing uh, to prohibiting D from serving the tainted food, and D was properly served. Now we have to have more than seventy-five thousand dollars if we're suing based on diversity. Where obviously there is no federal question involved here, so the suit must be based on diversity. When Pat sues based on uh, diversity, we have to have more than 75 and diversity of citizenship. But the citizenship is okay, right? Because these, you have two, two places of domicile for a corporation, 
Don't forget to mention those two places of domicile, and both of them are here in state Y. So a hospital is clearly not a resident of state X, whereas Pat is a resident of state X, so a diversity of citizenship is okay. But as to the amount in controversy, he's only claimed 70000 for himself plus an injunction. And if he wants to get above $75,000, what he has to do is to claim in the pleadings itself, he must claim that this is more than $5,000. It's a claim that the injunction is worth more than $5,000. Now, there are two ways to look at this injunction to see if it's more than $5,000. Some jurisdictions, apparently the majority view, looks at it in terms of the benefits to the plaintiff. Is the plaintiff going to get more than $5,000 of value out of this injunction? And the plaintiff must claim that I'm getting more than $5,000. Otherwise, the pleading is defective and you get dismissed. Uh, other jurisdictions look at it in terms of the cost of the defendant to, uh, to, to correct the problem. If it's going to cost the defendant more than 5000 to correct the problem. But the majority view is that the plaintiff is going to get a, uh, more than $5,000 worth out of the injunction. So looking, uh, we see already that to get, to get diversity jurisdiction, that this part is OK. We're going to have to make a problem, have a problem here because he didn't claim this. And you've got to claim it. The fact that it's true is not good enough if you don't claim it. Uh, the, uh, so we've got to get personal jurisdiction of a hospital and subject matter. This is the problem with the subject matter jurisdiction. And with personal jurisdiction, uh, we'll have to see. Continuing now. Um, it says at line 17, D was properly served with a complaint. Well, if we're going to get personal jurisdiction, we'll need over hospital. We need hospital must have enough contacts with state X. That's your basis. The long arm statute, state X must have a long arm statute. Could you close the door? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, uh, the state, the long arm statute. Uh, the uh, state y, state X, since you're suing in state X, has to have a long arm statute, and uh, it's a notice, long arm statute, and a basis. If we continue here, it says line 19. Before D responded to the civil complaint, Pat's brother paid pay, paid Pat's bail, and Pat's no longer contained detained. So Pat got out on bail. So Pat is out on bail. Now, uh, the federal district court then at line 24 denied a motion by D to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. So D is our, is our hospital here. This is D. And D says, no jurisdiction. Now, when the bar examiners say to you, there is no jurisdiction, that means they're saying to you, the person is saying both. There is no personal or subject matter jurisdiction. If you leave one of those out, you lose a lot of points. So don't do that. So. They, on the, in answer to the first question, they denied D's motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. So does the court have subject matter and personal jurisdiction of a hospital? As to subject matter jurisdiction of a hospital, we already know that the dispute is going to be right here. This is what you needed to write about. For. Uh, and you, all, you need to explain all these little things. You need to explain that the hospital is a corporation. It has two places of domicile. Explain on the facts why both of those places are here in state Y. 
and that Pat is from State X, and since you now have diversity of citizenship, that satisfies this part, then here, make your argument here, and point out that even if uh, Pat was, uh, uh, if the injury to Pat is worth, was worth more than $5,000, he has to plead it and say that. Uh, on the other hand, some jurisdictions say that it must, uh, that you look at how much it costs the hospital to fix this. So discuss all of that. Uh, the, um, and so uh, you, you, on its face, you don't really have, uh, the court does not have subject matter jurisdiction on its face because on the pleadings, uh, uh, Pat didn't claim this. Now, as to, pers as, to, so as to subject matter jurisdiction, the answer is no. On its face, the complaint does not give the court subject matter jurisdiction, but maybe the complaint can be corrected to fix this. There's another problem, and the problem is that Pat is now bailed out. And if Pat is bailed out, he's not going to be subject to the food anymore. And if he's not subject to the jail food anymore, uh, can he still claim that his injury is worth, uh, his future injury is worth more than $5,000 to him? Well, the answer may be no. Uh, if the jurisdiction uses the cost to the hospital to correct all this, then you still may have your 5000 But if you're looking at the benefit to a Pat, then you'd have to argue Pat's not there anymore, and maybe he won't get $5,000 worth of benefit. But Pat can argue that, you know, he is out on bail. The court could revoke his bail uh, for any number of reasons, and he may be back in there again. So he could claim that the matter is capable of repetition, yet evading review. Capable of repetition, yet evading review is the argument you might make here. Okay, so that takes care of the subject matter jurisdiction and all the little things you need to say. Next come personal jurisdiction against the hospital. The notice was given. We told us the hospital had notice. Long arm statute. Uh, they did not give us a long arm statute in the problem. However, you should point out that every state has a long arm statute. Just volunteer it. All states have long arm statutes. And the long arm statute uh, most likely is the constitutional type saying that state, the state X can exercise jurisdiction over hospital if hospital has the minimum contacts with state X. And so really, whether or not the long arm statute will reach the hospital will depend on whether or not a hospital has the minimum contacts. Does hospital have the minimum contacts on an adequate basis? And for that, we come here and we look at traditional basis. Hospital is not domiciled in state X, was not president in state X when served, and did not consent. Modernly, does hospital have systematic and continuous activities in state X? Well, I don't think so. Hospital, these prisoners are shipped over here and taken back from time to time. But I don't think hospital itself has systematic and continuous activities in state X. So a hospital over here does not, uh, you can't get general jurisdiction. Now we look to the minimum contacts of hospital in state X. So let's look at that see if we can get jurisdiction based on a minimum context doctrine. And we say, well, uh, maybe we can. Say so maybe we can because although hospital does not have systematic and continuous contacts in state X, hospital may have the minimum contacts for state X. Minimum contacts, we look for these factors. Does hospital purposely avail itself of some benefits of state X? Well, yeah, it's selling its services to state X all the time. And so that's a clear yes. That, uh, that's number one. The um, answer is yes. Uh, did the cause of action arise 
out of the contacts between hospital and state X? The answer is obviously yes. Is it foreseeable if you are a hospital in state Y, is it foreseeable that you may have to defend in state X? And the argument, you use your facts here a lot. I mean, the, the bar examiners are very, very uh, good about rewarding good use of facts. And so here you would point out that uh, it certainly should be foreseeable by state, by the hospital, that if they're uh, 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 keeping prisoners from state X, that uh, the hospital, and they don't treat them right, that they can expect a lawsuit from state X, and that it may very well happen in state X itself. So I, you can argue but that's, that that's foreseeable. Also, uh, don't forget that uh, in this case, the state has a strong interest in seeing to it that its prisoners are treated fairly, that it is con both it is convenient for the parties to locate and to litigate in state X because these state these facilities are obviously fairly close to each other. The location of evidence is against you. Put it in your answer because the location of evidence, the bad food and so forth is is obviously in state Y. So this one is not as good, but that's okay. So this, this stuff is in state Y. So make a point of that and discuss that. But overall, I think you would conclude that the, that, uh, the hospital has minimum contacts with state X because you can satisfy all these requirements. So that means then to get jurisdiction over state X, the hospital got notice because the facts said so. The state X has a long arm statute because every state has a long arm statute. You volunteer that and the basis requirement is satisfied through minimum contacts because you satisfy all of these requirements over here, all these requirements. Now, uh, so then we come to the second call of the question. The first call was uh, the federal court uh, denied a motion by D to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction they should not have done that. Item two, the federal court declined to certify the class on the grounds that the class was not large enough. Well, uh, the, uh, in these class action suits, uh, you remember that the court, people file class action suits when the, the number of people involved in the lawsuit are just too numerous for it to be practical to join the people. There's just too many of them. And as a general policy, from about 25 or less, uh, the court says you can probably join around 25 people or so in a lawsuit. You don't really need a class action. Above 50, the general rule is that you certainly are entitled to a class action if you can meet the other requirements. The numbers are large enough if you have more than 50. If you have 25 or less, eh, it's uh, probably not. Between 25 and 50, case by case. This case we have, you know, roughly 25, but also in this case, he's suing on behalf of all of the future prisoners who may come to this hospital. And we don't even know who those people are. This is kind of like Roe versus Wade where Mrs. Rowe was pregnant at the time she filed the lawsuit. She was the class representative, but she doesn't have to stay pregnant for the whole time that this case is going to the Supreme Court any more than our guy Pat needs to stay in jail. He can get out on bail and still be the class representative. He had to be a class representative at the time the suit was filed, but he doesn't have to stay that way all. I mean, he can continue to be a class representative even though the suit, the, uh, uh, he is no longer, she's no longer pregnant or he's no longer in jail. So the number is roughly between 25 and 50 plus in this case he's also uh, suing on behalf 
of other people who are going to continue to pass through that hospital, just like in Roe versus Wade, uh, Ms. Roe sued uh, on the behalf of all the pregnant women, you know, in Texas or in the United States. So the uh, she can. Uh, that uh, I think the the number of people, when you count those people, is quite large enough for this to be a class action suit. The third uh, question that you ask is, the court denied a motion by D to change venue to state Y. Well, let's look at the venue rules. They want to, the, uh, this court wants to move venue uh, they want to move the venue to this court. The question is, can you do it? Well, the uh, um, I can get a good marker here. And we move venue over to state Y. So the question is, what are the proper, where are the uh, places for a proper venue? And the answer is that proper venue is where, number one, there are three rules here. I'll tell you what those three rules are regarding proper venue. Uh, can I have you write that in black? It's not going to be very well just because of the... Uh, yeah, the dirty board. So the question is, where are the places of proper venue? And the answer is that there are three of them, one, two, and three. The first rule for proper venue is that proper venue is where all of the defendants reside, where all of the defendants reside. Well, that is state Y is the only defendant. So state Y is a place where all of the defendants reside. So state Y is a place of proper venue. Of course, if you're going to move venue, you can only move it to a place that is proper venue. Second place of proper venue, where a substantial part of the cause of action arose. Here, the place the cause of action arose in state Y. So that's the second ground on which this is a, a Y is proper venue. So this is where place where all the defendants reside, it's where the cause of action arose, a substantial part. And then part three uh, is that uh, if, if and only if neither of these can be satisfied, if and only if there is no place where all the defendants reside and there's no place, one place where a substantial part of the cause of action arose, then you can go to step three. And that's where any defendant can be served. But you never get to point number three where any defendant can be served. You never get there because there is a place that satisfies either one of these. So it happens we have a place that can satisfy both of them. So Y is a place of proper venue. X never was the proper venue because it doesn't fit either of these venue rules. So X never was a proper venue and the court should have granted it. You don't lose jurisdiction from just not having proper venue, you just get the case moved. And this case was moved, and you should point out that if you want to change venue, you need to do that uh, uh, at the first opportunity. You can't get halfway through the trial and then decide to change venue. So that should, has to be done right away, and it was done right away in this case. Next comes item four. The court granted a motion by D to miss, dismiss the action as moot. Well, why would the court uh, believe the action was moot? Well, the only reason for the action to be moot is that Pat's not in jail anymore. But we know that Mrs. Rowe does not have to stay, didn't have to stay pregnant for five years. So you can be a class, to be a class representative, you must uh, uh, be a typical member of the class when the suit is filed. Mrs. Rowe needed to be pregnant when the suit was filed, but she did. You don't have to stay uh, that way through.
throughout the lawsuit. So long as the court says, as long as there are other people out there who have the problem and you meet the other requirements that you, the class representative, you're going to adequately represent their interest. Well, here, that uh, then the proper place of venue, the state X never was a proper place of venue, and uh, the, um, um, the case, pardon me, we're talking about mootness, the case is not moot simply because Pat's not in jail anymore. He doesn't have to stay pregnant the whole time. So that's how you would answer uh, the calls to that question. Uh, we have a, um, another question that I want to go over quickly. It's, um, we'll do it in a very summary fashion, but it will be helpful. This is a question from the February 02 bar. This question says, Pam, a resident of State X uh, brought a suit in court in State X against Danco, a corporation, with its principal place of business in State Y. So it looks like Pam sued in State court, sued Danco in State court, and Danco has its principal place of business in State Y, but we don't know where Danco is incorporated. Remember that you cannot, you can't violate the diversity rule, and we don't know where Danco is incorporated. It might be State X. In any event, she brought this suit in State Y, uh, in state court. Now, if you're in state court, you don't really care because you don't have a diversity problem in state court. The suit was for damages for ninety thousand dollars, alleging that Danco breached a contract to supply Pam with paper goods with, with, for which she paid 90000 in advance. In her complaint, Pam requested a jury trial. Well, that's fine. She's entitled to a jury trial if she wants to. But, continuing at line 8, State X law provides that the contract disputes for less than 200000 must be tried by a judge. So she's in state court and she's only going to get a trial by judge, not by jury, even though she asked for a jury. Second paragraph. Danco removed the case to federal court in state X. Now, you can remove a case to federal court if the case could have been brought in federal court to begin with. Um, to decide if the case could have been brought in federal court to begin with, this would have been a diversity case. This means that um, there must be diversity between Pam and Danco, and we've got a problem because we don't really know where Danco is incorporated. So there might not be diversity, and so she may not be able to remove this to federal court because she couldn't have brought it there to begin with. On the other hand, um, the, um, the uh, uh, so, so we don't know if she can, you have to remove to federal court within 30 days uh, and doesn't say how long it took to do that, so I assume she did it promptly. Danco moved to strike the request for a jury trial. Well, you're in federal court now, and she asked for a jury trial, and the rule in federal court, not state court, the rule in federal court <coughs> is that you are entitled under the Seventh Amendment, you're entitled to a jury trial for any dispute known at common law that's worth more than $20. Well, she's suing for 90000 and this is a contract dispute known at common law, and so she is in federal court as a matter of the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution. She is entitled to a jury trial. Uh, so when this matter gets removed to federal court, you're going to use state substantive law on whether or not there was a breach of contract, but you're going to use a federal procedural law. That's the Erie Doctrine. Well, whether or not you're going to get a jury trial is clearly a procedural issue. It does not deal with the merits of the case. It only deals with how you're going to proceed. So she is entitled to a jury trial in federal court. Line 14. A few days before trial, Pam learned for the first time that Danco was incorporated in State X. Oh, my goodness. Well. If Danco is incorporated in State X, there's no diversity between Pam and Danco. 
and the federal court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction. The matter must go back to, um, must go back to state court, has to be remanded back to state court. Um, the, um, I also think there's some fraud going on here because Danco removed this matter to, to federal court. Danco must have known there was no diversity. Danco must have known its own state of incorporation. And when it moved to federal court, it was claiming this was a removable case, and it really wasn't. So I think Danco committed some fraud there, but I'm not sure you ask about that. So she, uh, she moved to have the case remanded back to state court on this ground, and of course it should be. The court denied this motion wrong. The court should have granted it. it has to go back. Line 18. At trial, Pam testified that she paid for the goods but never received them. Okay. Dan admitted receiving Pam's payment and then presented evidence from its dispatcher that it had sent a truck to Pam's office with the paper goods. So Pam is saying she didn't get them, and uh, Danco is saying, but I sent them. Continuing at line 20. Danco also, so Danco <coughs> called the dispatcher to say he sent them. Line 20, Dan also called a witness named Rafi who works in a building next to Pam's office. And Rafi testified that he saw a truck stop at Pam's office on the day Danco claims it delivered the goods. Rafi also testified he saw the truck driver take boxes marked paper goods into Pam's office that same day. My goodness, this doesn't look so good for Pam. Line 25, at the close of all the evidence, Pam moved for judgment as a matter of law. And Dan opposed the verdict. The jury returned a verdict in favor of Pam. Well, Pam wants a judgment as a matter of law. The only way Pam can be entitled to judgment as a matter of law is, is if no rational person could vote against Pam. Pam says, I didn't receive the goods, but Danko put on a lot of evidence that she might have received the goods, probably did. And so uh, the, uh, the uh, Pam is not entitled to judgment as a matter of law that uh, in her favor, because this is not a case where no rational person could vote against her. Uh, the uh, Dan opposed the motion, line 26. The jury returned a verdict in favor of Pam. That's interesting. Uh, I don't think she should have won that, but let's go to line 28. Danco then moved for judgment as a matter of law, which Pam opposed. Well, uh, Dan can't move for judgment as a matter of law at this point because the jury has already gone out and come back with the results. He's asking the court to overall overrule the jury verdict. If you want to make a motion for judgment as a matter of law, you got to do it before the jury goes out. You're basically saying to the judge, you don't even need the jury verdict. You can see that there's no other way for them to come back. You have to ask for that before the jury comes goes out. When the jury comes back, if the jury if the judge overrules the jury, it violates the Seventh Amendment. You can't overrule the jury verdict. But if the judge, if you make the motion, judge, don't even submit this to the jury because it's obvious that I win. And the judge says, well, let me think about that. And while I'm thinking about that before the jury goes out, let's have the jury go ahead and do their thing. And when the jury comes back, if the judge doesn't like the verdict that the jury came back with, now the judge can say, well, that motion that you made before the jury went out, I have decided to grant that motion. Okay. But you have to make that motion before the jury went out. And Danco did not do that, and that's what's wrong. The, uh, Three calls of the question. Number one, Danco's motion to strike the request for a jury trial. No Seventh Amendment, she's entitled to a jury trial. Item two, Pam's motion to have the case remanded to state court. It should have been. Federal court does not have jurisdiction. They lost the diversity. Item three, Pamco and Danco's motions for judgment as a matter of law. Well, Pam had, you know, asked for judgment as a matter of law. I don't think she's entitled to it because the evidence is not that strong in her favor. In fact, it tends to be against her. 
uh, where, and so I think Pam, Pam is not entitled to judgment as a matter of law because she doesn't have the evidence. As to Danco, Danco is not entitled to judgment as a matter of law because Danco didn't ask for it before the jury went out. And that's the answer to that third question. And that's the end of this lecture. We will be doing a special lecture on California civil procedure.